Hello, and welcome to the Women Designers You Should Know podcast, the show that celebrates the groundbreaking contributions of women designers who have shaped the world we live in today. From graphic designers to architects, industrial designers to fashion icons, join us as we delve into the inspiring stories of the women who came before us, breaking barriers and paving the way for future generations. In each episode, we'll uncover the remarkable journeys of these unsung heroes, shedding light on their innovative designs, their challenges, and their triumphs. Let's make these extraordinary women household names. So whether you're a design enthusiast, a history buff, or simply curious about the remarkable women who have shaped our world, tune in and embark on a journey through the untold stories of women designers you should know. I'm your host, Amber AC, and this all started with my series of the same name that went viral on Instagram. The series has highlighted 31 women so far and has reached an audience of 3 million accounts, and I'm so glad it's hitting a chord with so many of you. It's actually putting a fire under me that I never knew I needed to continue this work, so thank you. In today's episode, I'm joined by the incredible designer Meryl Vidros as we dive into the remarkable life of Gunta Stolzl, a visionary force at the iconic Bauhaus in Germany. We uncover what it truly meant to be a woman navigating the male-dominated world of design during the early 20th century. From her groundbreaking textile designs to her influential role as the only female master at Bauhaus, we'll explore the enduring legacy of Gunta Stolzl and how her innovative spirit continues to inspire designers around the globe. Meryl is a designer, researcher, and self-proclaimed citizen of the world who has explored over 30 countries as a nomad and design researcher. She's worked at Pentagram, Foda, Willoughby Design, and Google, among others, And in 2016, she founded Vidro Studio. Given her nomad tendencies and understanding that creativity is not limited to borders or time zones, the studio now has offices and collaborations in Berlin, Brooklyn, LA, Austin, and Toronto. Mm -hmm. Clients such as the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, Google, YouTube, they all seem to like the results. At the same time, Meryl devotes her time and expertise to mentor young women on building a life with purpose and finding confidence in their career. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. And official. I have to give the listener a backstory about us. So we met about a year ago and I had gone to the Academy Museum um, uh, shortly before we met kind of a thing. And I was blown away by all the design. I noticed that the, it was, it was actually touched by a designer, you know, when you can notice that when you go somewhere and you're like a designer did this. And then it was shortly after that, that brand new put a post out about that redesign. And I was shocked by the comments because everyone was just kind of being really critical about one thing that they could see they weren't even looking at the whole project and it was yeah (laughs) maybe it was all men I don't know and so I was like what are you guys talking about the like in-store experience of this is amazing like everything is thought through and and then you dm me and it turned out there was a woman behind it like I literally didn't know it was a woman before I had said that comment and then from there we hung out we've hung out a couple times and we spoke at the first round conference and I'm just loving where this friendship is going. So I'm so I glad too. to have you here. So my first question for you is, how did you decide to become a designer? Well, I grew up in a creative family in the Midwest. Uh, my grandmother was a painter, my father a photographer, my mom made clothing, and the creativity was always inherent in me. And then when I was 19, I got into Parsons School of Design. And, you know, you submit paintings, drawings and whatnot. You don't really know what kind of creative you'll become. But I got to, got into Parsons and actually changed my name to Meryl. My first name's Christine. Oh, Fun I did factoid. not know that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was like, I'm going to go by Meryl, just my middle name, and move to New York and become a designer. I can be anybody that I want. And I did just that. Um, and given my love at shop of shopping at 19 years old, I was like, okay, I'll be a fashion designer. And then I accidentally walked into a typography class. Um, and I was so struck by the fact that alphabets could make 
you could make a living out of alphabets. And that was graphic design. What would you say inspires you? Nature, being outdoors, travel, the outer world, life, friendships, being happy and being touched inside brings out the creative self that I need to create and be free when I am actually designing. Mm. I think that the child self has such an important role on um, me as a designer that I don't necessarily get as much when I look through design books or Pinterest or for that matter. So Mm -hmm. I just have a few questions for you. Love it. Answer as fast as you want. Okay. (laughs) Introvert or extrovert? Extrovert. Summer or winter? Summer. Dine in or dine out? Dine out. Minimalist or maximalist? Minimalist. Desktop or laptop? Desktop. Grid or freestyle? Freestyle. Pastels or neons? Pastels. Creative hours, day or night? Very early morning. (laughs) Serif or sans? Sans. Digital design or physical design? Physical. One long project or a bunch of tiny projects? A bunch of tiny projects. Design to a playlist or podcast? Silence. (laughs) (laughs) Playlist. Definitely to this. (laughs) Okay, so we are talking about Gunta Stoltz today. And you chose her and suggested we talk about her today. So I want to know more about why you chose Gunta. Gunta is my forever inspiration. I mean, I am obsessed with the Bauhaus. Uh, It was a huge reason that I moved to Berlin. And Gunta, to me, is the epitome of color, form, function, abstract, play, She so embraces life and the self. And that to me is just a gorgeous designer, you know, Mm -hmm. somebody who lives life well and designs with their whole self. When you were in Berlin, did you feel inspired by her and her presence? And did you feel like you identified with her? Yeah, I mean, I actually discovered her when I went and visited the Bauhaus in Dessau. I paid the extra 75 euros to, I I know, what a dream, to stay and sleep in (gasps) the dorms. Wow. The original dorm rooms. Ugh. I know. That gives me chills. Totally. And her textiles were in the room. Like their bedding that she designed. Oh, right. Yeah. um, Was in the room and just feeling that presence of, you know, such a starkly minimal, beautifully designed room building that, you know, is very much the epitome of masculinity at the Bauhaus. And then to me, her work was just this beautiful textural feminine touch that the room wouldn't be the same without. And the more I learned about her, you know, she's this mountaineering woman who had nomadic tendencies. I just, I so related to that because in my 20s, when I started Bidro Studio, I was that, you know, I, I remember sleeping on a rooftop tent in Vietnam I slept on the China border in a Hello Kitty blanket. (laughs) Wow. I mean, to save money, I slept on trains. And, you know, I mean, my budget was very limited at the time trying to start a business abroad. And, um, you know, you're scared. You're scared you're going to have to go back home if you don't save enough money. And I think she had that same mentality, but like loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get started and chat about Gunta then. Just to preface the sources uh, for everything that we've researched today is from the 2019 book Bauhaus Women, A Global Perspective, 2022 Daily Art Magazine article, a 1999 Bauhaus book by Anja Baumhoff. Um, and then a, there was this 2012 talk at the Barbican Center in London by her daughter, Monica called Bauhaus Art as Life. And then uh, we'll be reading literal entries from her diary. So a quick overview. As the only female master of the Bauhaus, textile artist Gunta Stoltz is arguably the single most influential figure in the modern history of Western woven art. 
Under her leadership, the school's weaving workshop was transformed from a neglected department to one of its most successful facilities. She was born in 1897 in Munich, Germany. She kept diaries from the age of 14 on, and her family valued education. Her father was a school principal and active in education and education reform. And her grandfather, great grandfather, actually was a weaving master. I thought that was such a cool detail. (laughs) After high school, she went to an arts and crafts school from 1913 to 1916. And she was only 16 when she graduated high school and started studying at this arts and crafts school. She studied decorative painting, glass painting, ceramics, and art history. And while she was there, she made hundreds of sketches of landscapes, architecture, and portraits. She also spent hours and hours on calligraphy in class, which she (laughs) hated. I don't blame her. (laughs) And so going into the Bauhaus, um, the Bauhaus started in 1919, founded by Walter Gropius. And at the beginning, there was a manifesto in, in pamphlet form that was sent out to announce this new school and what it would be about. And in that manifesto, it said, any person of good repute without regard to age or sex whose previous education is deemed adequate by the Council of Masters will be admitted as far as space permits. Oh, my God. Women went wild over this news because it said regardless of sex or age. So Gunta came across the manifesto and decided to continue her studies at the newly formed Bauhaus School. And so her diary entry for one of her 1919 entries, she makes references to Johannes Itten's famous preliminary course. She said, Itten doesn't want to teach us how to paint or draw or make art. Nobody can do that. Instead, he simply wants to take us to the point where we will free ourselves. Oh. I mean, that's everything. Isn't that beautiful? It's so beautiful. Her daughter points this out too, but she's very romantic about the way she describes the Bauhaus and art and all of that. In fact, this is a quote. I want you to read this. Itten's first words were about rhythm. One must first educate one's hand, first make the fingers supple. We do finger exercises just like a pianist does. In these beginnings, we already sense through what it is that rhythm occurs. An endless circular movement begun with the fingertips. The movement floods through the wrist, elbow, and shoulder to the heart. One must feel this in every mark, every line. (laughs) Seriously? Isn't that amazing? I want to go grab a drink with him. (laughs) (laughs) He is deep. It's so amazing how you're talking about basically a human person being one with art and that the art is flowing through their body. It totally, and it absolutely does feel like that when you're in flow state, Mm -hmm. you know, this like out of almost out of body experience of the soul and your guttural response to what you're creating and what feels right. And you can continue on that tangent to create something marvelous. Mm -hmm. By 1920, Stoltz had not only been fully accepted into the Bauhaus school, but had received a scholarship to attend. It was said that Gropius accepted her without hesitation based on her drawings in her application. And another thing that she said when she was accepted, and I love this part, she says, nothing stands in the way of my outer life. I can have a hand in shaping it however I want. Oh, how often I've dreamt of it. And now it's really coming true. I still can't believe it. Oh. <laughs> um, and I loved how Gunta saw the Bauhaus. To her, it was a way of life. And it was interesting because for them at that time, it was also a kind of rebellious against the arts and crafts movement. And they had this resentment towards it and knowing that she had just come from an arts and crafts school. Um, supposedly she even threw away all that work from that school while she was at the Bauhaus. Oh God, seriously? <laughs> yeah. Like in true rebellious nature. So then let's talk about student life at the Bauhaus. So at the beginning, the Bauhaus was this very relaxed environment. Those first few years that they were in Weimar, they were wholly dependent and students were teaching themselves and each other. 
They always reminisced about those early years as the most exciting with a vibrant social life. And they had spontaneous get togethers and intense friendships and plenty of time for free experimentation. Oh, one thing that Gunta said is time did not matter. The attempt to live and give shape to the new was the only thing that was urgent. She was adventurous and traveled to Italy during her first summer at the Bauhaus. She slept on benches in parks and stayed with families on farms, and she would draw portraits in exchange for lodging. Oh, hell yeah, girl. <laughs> I so relate to that. <laughs> Have you ever exchanged your artwork for as for, money for something? Oh my God, you name it. Absolutely. <laughs> So, of course, we have to get into the weaving workshop. Within Stolt's first year at the Bauhaus, she began what she referred to as the women's department, which, due to underlying gender roles within the school, eventually became synonymous with the weaving workshop. And Walter Gropius reached out and gave her more responsibility over the women's department, which was also around the time that she decided to switch from painting to weaving. So there was still a master of weaving at the time, even though she was given some responsibilities. His name was George Moosh, and he was the head of the weaving workshop and had very little interest in the craft itself. He saw weaving and other textile arts as women's work. There's very little information and, and education at the Bauhaus for weaving, so Gunta and some of the other women took courses outside of the school to learn the technical aspects of weaving. They took courses in dyeing fabrics and even learned how to dye fabrics with colors from plants. What was it like as a woman at the Bauhaus? Um, what Gunta Stoltz did not know that we know now is that the masters were alarmed at the large number of women, which they thought might create an amateurish environment. They had even advised the women to not choose any other craft but weaving. And the masters had an old-fashioned idea of what a woman was able to do. The fear that too many women were at the Bauhaus, they were worried that they would start to look like an arts and crafts school. So they tried hard to gather all of these women in the so-called women's classes which was very much in contradiction to the equal rights promise to women and the talented, enthusiastic Gunta with her social skills was just what they needed to keep the women there. The school had hardly any equipment. Students sat on the floor to draw. And in another Itin class, it was their expressionist nude studies. Um, that was completely new for her as nude studies had been closed to female students in their former schools. Wow. <laughs> Can you believe that? I'm so glad that, first of all, the Bauhaus opened up nude studies for them too and gave them the opportunity. And yet at the same time, it was very conflicting because not only was the Bauhaus open to women and you can come in regardless of gender. And yet, while you're at the Bauhaus, you were kind of pushed into the weaving department and into the women's areas. So there's this idea of, did Gunta have internalized sexism? Gunta's daughter, Monica, said that Gunta once refused an interview with a feminist journal, which is maybe proof that she never in all her life was aware of these things. And later on in an interview with the Bauhaus Journal Offset in 1926, she said, weaving is primarily a woman's field of work. So kind of already this internalized sexism of this is what I've been told. And obviously I'm living it and experiencing it and believe it kind of a thing. I just love that she, um, I mean, you know, of course, part of that is sad. The, you know, part of her, you know, sort of being closed off to some of these uh, more progressive ideas or maybe just not aware of them. But then there's another part of it that, you know, maybe I'm hearing it wrong, but I like that she glorifies her cla her craft and mm -hmm. sees it as something of like, yeah, this is where we get to play and I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like I, the way I see it is she was definitely in her own bubble and world at the time. Yeah. 
and she made the most of it and she wasn't fully aware of what the men were thinking of her maybe or what they were saying behind closed doors. But at the end of the day, none of that mattered to her because she was on a mission and she was just full force ahead. She knew that this could turn into a business and she saw business opportunities out of it. And that business opportunity was, I know women, I understand women, and I'm going to sell this stuff to women. Yeah, and sell my work. Them. Yeah. Let's not forget that the Bauhaus was all about function and creating products. Mm -hmm. It was not an art school. It mm -hmm. was a design school. Yeah, it was all about function. So speaking of, let's talk about her style approach. So okay, I have to start with one of my favorite quotes ever yeah. from any designer or any artist. Gunta had said, the most important thing is life. I think as a designer, we can get so caught up in our work and mm -hmm. design and everything that encompasses that. But to be able to be a good artist and a good designer, you have to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. And apparently she just was all about her friendships and, you know, not only art, but making things that could improve people's lives. So it wasn't ever just, you know, a beautifully woven tapestry. It was how could this bring joy to people? Mm -hmm. And I so relate to that. She had this passion for experimentation and creating abstract, unique textiles. And I love that she was known for that, you know, applying these ideas from modern art into weaving. And you can really see that freedom in her work. Mm -hmm. If I'm saying it correctly, I'm sure there's going to be some German <laughs> <laughs> listener in, yeah. your, in, your, in your huge following. But Fabaschwila is to play with color. Okay. And she had this way of weaving with the to the tool that she used that holds the yarn um would turn she'd flip it around and turn it and reverse it. And that's one of the things that made her um her work look so abstract. So um you know nothing is quite symmetrical. Most things are off, but it's Mit den gewendeten Stutzen. Mm. <laughs> really Tell rolls me more. off the tongue. <laughs> um, so basically, she would take that tool, reverse it, and put it back in mm. a different, um, in a different way. Oh yeah, I've heard it as spoken as interrupted stripes. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly that. Yeah. That's how she would create it. That's so cool. And I'd never really thought about that idea before. You know, to me, it was just like creating patterns and layers of patterns and cutting the pattern here. And when you think about it in the practice of what she was doing, she's literally stopping the weave, as you were saying, turning it around and running that color back the other way. Right. And like, let's just talk about that for a minute, because these are the early 1900s. And, you know, I mean, you know, think about the paintings that were on walls at the in the 1900, early 1900s. Like, they were very traditional. Yeah. And it her, was scenes of, yeah, it like was like a literal scene with animals and plants. Yeah, super boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like that was their wall hanging in their library. Yeah. Was <laughs> and then were, what was going on at the Bauhaus? I mean, they were breaking rules with grids and graphic design and parties. You name it. it. So groundbreaking. And and textiles at that time were also very symmetrical and very safe mm -hmm. and you know here she goes this weaving machine that you know i'll also say they you know back to your point about you know they they um designed with what they had at the time she was a flat weaver which i didn't really know there was much of a difference between flat weaving versus vertical weaving but flat weaving was um is like a much quicker, cheaper, easier way to weave that mm. is easier for mass production. Okay. So, and that was, again, the point at the Bauhaus was how do we produce beautifully designed goods to the masses? Mm -hmm. anyway. So it was, it was productive or an yeah. effective way of working yeah. faster. Exactly. It wasn't, it, I mean, they were pieces of art, but 
They weren't super time consuming, tedious works that, you know, they only produced five in their career. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, she was banging them out. Yeah. (laughs) And I kind of think that this is a good test of how or just the truth to how modern it was, because when you look at all of her work, I would love to own any of that in my home. It's all it all looks like it could have been made today. Totally. But it was a hundred years ago, nearly, or totally. some of it. Yeah. Yeah. And and what's amazing to me is even looking at like, you know, Ikea's collections are still inspired mm. by her work. Yes. Like to this day. Mm-hmm. That's wild. So amazing. Yeah. The influence that she's had. So let's talk about one of your favorite pieces of Gunta's that you wanted to highlight today. This lit tapestry, red slash green. So amazing. It's this wild burst of colors, patterns, just unexpected, playful moments. To me, it doesn't even look like a tapestry. It looks like a time warped, you know, trippy dream that one would have sleeping by the beach after they've just looked at art all day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a Aquatic, it's wild, it's it's so encompassing to me of the ideal human experience. Mm-hmm. And it says a lot about who she was at the core, was which is that adventurous side of her. Oh. And in her early years of creating art and sketches, it was all about landscapes and architecture. And you can almost see that here where there might be hills or water or buildings, structural elements, and totally. maybe a horizon. Like there's just, there's so much intrigue and it keeps you staring at it over and over again because it's so abstract. Yeah, absolutely. And while I love the the ba- other Bauhaus masters and how rigid they are with lines, to me, this piece in her work does epitomize the quote that I said early that the most important thing is life Mm. you know when I look at Mies van der Rohe's or Marcel Breuer's work I don't think about life I think about like just the most gorgeous looking chair but when I see her work I see the human soul yeah Yeah. totally Mm -hmm. her perspective on life and yeah I mean I it's true it kind of makes I feel like art makes life worth living And seeing art through others' eyes. Absolutely. She would paint her idea of of the design of the weave before she would start weaving. And her daughter had pointed this out, but you really only see so much of your weave at a time. And then it moves on and you're only looking at a chunk at a time. And sometimes she would embrace that and just get free with it and see what the end result would look like. And then sometimes she would block it out and she has all of these sketches and paintings that are clearly these ideas that could be easily translated into a wall hanging. And it's so beautiful that she was blocking this out, really seeing it and understanding it as a whole before she would get started and and actually be technically perfect at it, too. (laughs) Yeah, actually, I also wanted to show you this other thing from Sketch. So this is her sketch to the incredible thing. And like you can just toggle and see it side by side and see how she stayed true to the sketch in some areas. And in other areas, it looked like it took on a different form. God, I want to be friends with her so bad. (laughs) One thing to call out about the Bauhaus is that there were kind of two big phases of it. There's the Weimar phase when it was in Weimar and then the Dessau phase. And um, and so, of course, all of these early experimental years took place in Weimar and that was where she ended up graduating. And then between 1925 and 1926, the Bauhaus was closed and had moved locations to Dessau. And so the Dessau campus was equipped with greater variety of looms and improved dyeing facilities. 
And Gunta returned to becoming the Weaving Studios technical director. And she worked with George Moosh, um, the the master that's been there all along that has no interest really in weaving. Probably hasn't done very much work. Yeah, just kind of <laughs> sat there and <laughs> watched everyone. I don't know. And so he would remain the form master. And um, she wasn't officially made a master yet until 1927, Um, But it was clear that both the organization and content of the workshop were under her control. So it was obvious from the start that George and Gunta did not enjoy working together, which resulted in Gunta running the workshop almost single-handedly. Hell yeah, girl. And then after a revolution among the students where they demanded he leave, which was described (laughs) as unheard of behavior from the weavers... (laughs) George ended up leaving and Gunta officially took over both as form master and master craft. So I thought that was really impressive that, you know, it, she she proved herself. She was obviously the person that needed to be there all along. And I feel like a lot of these men had to really res- push past their their like finite thinking of what women could do and of gender. And realize Gunta is up is up for this role. She's been doing it all these years and has proven herself. Why not make her master? I mean, which is also such a crazy concept at the time because women were not put in leadership positions mm-hmm. without she, a man either. Right? Yeah, yeah. As a co- at least a co-founder mm-hmm. or a co-creator, but she stepped in and completely replaced him. Yeah, I mean, girl. And it sounds like she didn't have that bad of imposter syndrome. So I'm curious yeah. what she uh, what she was doing to yeah. get over that. I mean, supposedly <laughs> she was very humble about it, um, especially in the Weimar years. I think she had talked about not feeling like a teacher and that she really was just experimenting with everyone. But she was obviously leading. So I, I don't think she had imposter syndrome. I think she was just having fun and helping people and leading people and not even really realizing the impact that she had. Um, I don't know when this happened, but she has this Bauhaus ID and there's a photo of it and she would write in Meister. Oh my God. Yeah. Master. Master. Meister. And she, she already claimed that title when no one gave (laughs) that to her. (laughs) Oh my God. Fake it till you make it. Yeah. In fact, she changed the perception of, of weaving. Under her direction, the fabrics and prototypes made by the workshop became one of the school's largest sources oh of income. God. I did not know that. <laughs> Incredible. Like, here they're thinking, okay, women, go to your little yeah, corner and your weave. Yeah. And then turns out they're the ones that are supporting the Bauhaus financially. They even closed a business deal with the Berlin textile company Polytex, licensing their designs to be put into production. Wow. (laughs) So now that she was master, she continued to improve the weaving workshop even more. She insisted that the women were taught math and geometry to be even better at weaving. (laughs) So she's seeing those problems and she's like, we need this. We need that. She was an advocate for all of them. And they had funding to add more looms and experiment with unique materials. She taught from a very design focused approach, bringing an emphasis to emphasis to simplicity and functionality. They tested materials for qualities such as color, texture, structure, resistance to wear, flexibility, light refraction, and sound absorption. That's incredible. Yeah, they thought of it all. And then in 1930, Stoltz issued the first ever Bauhaus Weaving Workshop diplomas. Oh my God, right. She designed them. Were they not receiving diplomas at that point? I have no idea. They weren't giving the women diplomas or anyone at Bauhaus diplomas. I mean, I'm sure they were giving diplomas i mean that'd be crazy not to at least Mm -hmm. a certificate one thing to call out too is her experience as a master was often frustrating she fought for pay and recognition equal to those of the other masters the male masters they made changes to her contract at one point in 1930 to help but those were only marginally better so i mean that's kind of hard to be in that place and to be be so so new yeah 
Can you imagine if you're bringing in a majority of the revenue mm-hmm. to your school and they're not paying you well, they're not, you know, upgrading your equipment, mm-hmm. I would be livid. Yeah. While she was a master, she married one of the architecture students and they had a daughter together, Yael, and she was taking care of her baby and teaching at the same time, which was surprisingly off-putting by some of the Bauhaus members. They thought she should let go of her career and focus on motherhood. This was 1930 1930 and 31. Things were getting politically intense in Germany and... Not the Nazis were starting to um, get more political power and had majority votes in some of these cities and towns, especially this Dessau, which is East Germany. Yeah, and so, so that was part of the problem too. Was now like the Nazis really were kind of already gaining control of their own city of the town that they were in and so there's political divide at this point and it turned into competition and jealousy and personal hunger for power some of the students criticized her direction and fought over profits from that polytex business and her husband was jewish and Almost all of her longstanding friends and many of the students had already left the Bauhaus by that point because a lot of them graduated in 1930 and a lot of those were her friends. Basically, at that point, it was kind of coming to a head and it wasn't until she found a swastika painted at her door and Kandinsky not really defending her Mm. that she ended up resigning I mean, everyone feared for the Bauhaus as a whole, and unfortunately, the campus was closed and moved to Berlin in 1932, so basically about a year after she resigned, and then just a year later, it was officially dissolved by the faculty. It just didn't last, and it couldn't last under that, like, Nazi regime. So her and her husband and daughter moved to Zurich, and she ended up starting a business there. And they called it S&H Stoff. She produced fabrics and textiles for clothes and furniture in her business. They received a major commission from the Zurich Cinema to create curtains. Oh, my God. Yeah. Seriously. (laughs) And so she was thriving, it kind of felt like. The only hard part was obviously she was a woman in business at the time and probably faced limitations there. Um, And she also mentioned that the textile industry in Switzerland was old fashioned. And so coming from the Bauhaus and having Bauhaus (laughs) ideas of let's do different materials, let's throw in some cellophane and metal and whatever she had in her mind just didn't work for them. So it was really hard for her to have to like confine to their old fashioned ways. And she, I think the nice thing to hear, she never tired of designing textiles. Um, She would make dresses for her daughters. Her daughter, Monica was then um, born in Switzerland at this time in the sixties too. And during the following decades, the museum of modern art in New York acquired pieces of her work while she continued to work Um, And then when she dissolved her business and closed up and kind of retired, the Victorian Albert Museum acquired her designs as like a huge collection, too. And in her later years, she returned to tapestry weaving and creating wall hangings um, because a majority of her business, her like 30 plus year business really was driven by like textiles and creating textiles that would be used in furniture and in clothes. And so she kind of missed doing these huge artful tapestry weavings. But what are your final thoughts going through all of this and really diving into her life? Yeah, I, you know, with everything that we learned today and kind of going back to this philosophy about, you know, like life is the most important thing and enjoying your life with the people around you. She really lived up to that with the community that she had with the women at the Bauhaus and just really carved a path for herself. It's so inspiring and really comes through in her work in a way that I think is quite unique for the Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. You know, her use of color, abstracted shape through textiles, they feel paintings. Mm -hmm. When you really think about her whole story and how much of an integral, integral part of the Bauhaus she was and seeing her work in the context of, you know, the Bauhaus portfolio and 
all the textiles that came out after, you realize Gunta was the Bauhaus. She made it what it was. She was a huge, pivotal part of it. Absolutely. And her whole corner was basically what all the women, or majority, not all, but majority yeah. of the women were doing. She was leading that. And the art that came out of it was clearly inspired by her and thanks to her like technical skills and teaching and all of that. Like really, when you think of the Bauhaus, we all think about Walter Gropius and Kandinsky and Paul Klee. Andrew, and, oh, yeah. yeah. And and Gunta should be in there. She is one of them. Yeah. And she is just as influential and just as big of a part of it as them. Absolutely. That's so well said. And I couldn't agree more. Thank you for coming. God, absolutely. This was so much fun. Yeah. I'm so glad that I chose to speak about her and, you know, she hadn't been plucked yet. Mm -hmm. She's just such a treasure. And I don't know who came up with it, but Frau House. Have you heard this? Frau means female in oh, German yeah. or woman in German. Oh, yeah. Um, but I wonder if they had coined their their wing of the Bauhaus, the Frau, the Frau House. House. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Here's to the Frau House and Gunta and everything she did. Heck yeah. Prost. Thank you for joining us today. And a big thank you to Meryl Vidros. You can find her design agency on Instagram at Vidros Studio or her website, which is vidrosstudio.com. Your support means the world and will help get this podcast up and running in order to spotlight more remarkable women. If you find this episode inspiring, please consider leaving a review, subscribing, and sharing it with your friends and family and colleagues. Together, let's redesign history by celebrating women. Mm -hmm.